Hi, I'm Evan Howard, and this is Jim Wilhoyt, and we're the authors of Discovering Lexio Divina, Bringing or Scripture into Ordinary Life. In this fourth session, we'll talk on, about meditating on Scripture as a part of Lexio Divina. Jim, the word meditate brings up all kinds of concerns or wonders to people who hear that word today. How do you explain meditation for people? Sure, I'll read a little bit from our book here on page 77 and 78, but what I'd want to say is that everyone meditates. It's really a question of what do you meditate on? You know, the word meditation may sound a bit exotic. You might even wonder, is it okay to meditate? No worry, you're already doing it. While the Bible has a lot to say about meditation, it assumes that everyone meditates, just as it assumes that everyone worships. The Bible concerns itself with who or what we worship and with what we meditate about, directing our minds to scripture, creation, and redemption. But it assumes meditation rather than commands it. At the most basic level, meditation is our dwelling on, obsessing over, scheming about, daydreaming about, fantasizing over something we value. Think of the children's game in which you seek to move a ball through a maze. And one of the obstacles is a groove that divert, diverts the ball away from the goal. The automatic meditations of our heart are like a well-worn groove that channels and directs the ball of our thinking. That is why Jesus is so concerned about worry. Worry is a form of meditation. It is a way of practicing the presence of doubt and spiritual darkness as we actively question God's providential care for us. We do not have to say, let's set aside some time and worry and obsess over this. Worry just happens. Automatically, the worry groove diverts the ball of our thoughts and we replay our fears again and again. Even though we might say we agree with Jesus that worry is futile and utterly hopeless at improving our lives, we all meditate. We all think about things that hook us. The psalmist called his automatic meditations the meditation of my heart, Psalm 19, verse 14. And he prayed that they, along with his words, would be pleasing to God. Whether they are unhealthy fears or godly tears, our thoughts return again and again to familiar thought patterns. In fact, we often spend mental energy trying to turn off some of these seemingly automatic meditations. Unlike the mind chatter of automatic meditation, intentional meditation is a deliberate and thought and provides a way to change our automatic thoughts. The power of practice meditation comes from the way it shapes our patterns of automatic thinking, making them less negative and more appreciative of the grace that fills our lives, and changing their actual content as our minds are filled with noble truths that restore and set us right. Christians have practiced many forms of intentional meditation through the ages, many of them directly connected with the text of Scripture itself. Hmm. So Evan, in our book, we talk about slowing down and taking in as two parts of meditation. Uh, how do you do this? Well, I guess one way is that I read slow and I make sure that the stuff sinks in and, and I play with it a little bit. One way I like to do is to chant. Every once in a while, um, I just pretend I'm a monk and I chant. And I'll soon say something like, O oh Lord, I am not proud. I have no haughty looks. I do not occupy myself with great matters or with things that are too hard for me. But I still my soul and make it quiet, like a child upon its mother's breast. My soul is quieted within me, and so on. And then, after I have done that and do it slowly, then maybe I, I repeat, and I meditate by repeating. I do not occupy myself with great matters. I do not occupy myself with great matters. I do not occupy myself with great matters. 
And I think my philosophy class comes to my mind and I'm wondering, ooh, is the question of epistemology here too great a matter? Is it something too hard for me? And I repeat and I think and it, it comes up. And then sometimes that's, that's the, the taking it in. Uh, another way I take things in is to imagine. Like the story in the other video earlier about Zacchaeus. And I picture in my mind uh, Jesus coming down the road. What does the road look like? What are the trees? How are the people crowded? And I picture myself as Zacchaeus, this little guy up in the tree. And I, and I imagine Jesus looking up at me and calling me by name. And I imagine us having dinner. And how do I feel when Jesus says, today salvation has come into his house? So that's, that's the way I, hmm. I, I slow down and I take it in, or at least some of the ways I do that. How about you, Jim? How do you meditate? All of those patterns, except for chanting. Uh, <laughs> but one of the things I find really useful as well is to go slow enough to see the connection at what I'll call the universal human experience in the story. Hmm. So you think in Genesis, you have that tension there between Isaac and Ishmael, where there is sibling rivalry, hmm. or the story of Joseph and his brothers. In those stories, uh, we have competition. And so I read that story, I also try and say, okay, sibling rivalry, when have I experienced that? What was my experience growing up in a family? Where have I heard that from my students? Oh, I can think of painful examples of competition in a family, sibling rivalry, and sometimes where parents use that for their own end. Mm -hmm. And so as I read this story, I'm beginning to think, where is, where have I experienced what they are experiencing? And at first glance, we can imagine an enormously wide river or chasm separating ourselves from a world of camels and nomads, uh, of a hard scrabble life. And I think, oh, but there's so much I share in common. I share these issues of uh, what it means for tension to be in a family. Hmm. Oh, I share that issue there of, of fear over my reputation. And so I look at what do I share, particularly the narratives uh, with the characters, uh, what is universal uh, to this passage. And there's a way that at times I've kept myself there and say, and until I really sort of feel it, I, I'm not gonna move on. Until I really mm -hmm. feel what I share, I, I am not going to uh, move on. So we've looked at a me what it means to meditate on a text. In our next video, we'll look more closely at contemplating.